Um, I'm Michael Dowd, as you probably know by now. Connie Barlow and I travel all over North America. We've lived on the road permanently for two years, almost two and a half years. And what we do is we go to colleges, universities, community colleges, high schools. Every Sunday we're preaching in some church, uh, delivering the homily or sermon at, at uh, some church, Protestant and Catholic. We do uh, programs also at Buddhist meditation centers, at Quaker meeting houses. We, we go to a pretty broad range of religious and educational uh, settings. And everywhere we go, what we do is we speak on the universe story, that is the 14 billion year story of the universe. And we do it in a sacred way. We do it in a God-glorifying way. That is, we help people understand how science can enrich and strengthen their faith. And I'm not talking about faith as some kind of otherworldly beliefs. I'm talking about how you live your life. I'm talking about how you live with your, your family and how you live with your your neighbors and your friends and, and, and basically how you can have like real joy in your life because you know you're making a difference in the world and being connected to God in the process. So a lot of people don't know that science can actually strengthen and enrich and deepen their faith. And so um, what I'd like to share with you a little bit now, so we've got about an hour and then we break for lunch and we've got almost, uh, what about an, almost another hour or so, um, not quite. So what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about where, where I'm coming from and where we're coming from. And then I'd like to just, before I go any beyond that, uh, sh hear some of the questions that you'd love to hear discussed uh, related to science and religion. Uh, I call myself an evolutionary theologian. That is, I, I, I help people see how they can relate to God in a more intimate, a more personal way as a result of embracing rather than rejecting evolution. I used to be an anti-evolutionary fundamentalist. I used to be totally threatened by the evolutionary perspective. In fact, yeah, have you ever seen those little tracts, you know, those little pamphlets that sometimes fundamentalists or evangelicals pass out? It's, I used to be very threatened. In fact, I used to pass those things out at science gatherings where people were teaching science, I would show up because I believe that it was, I believe that evolution was of the devil, basically. I, I thought that the world was only a few thousand years old. And now, of course, I travel all over North America with my wife, popularizing a sacred way of understanding evolution. So clearly something happened for me to go from there to where I am now. So what I'd like to do is share with you a little bit of that um, and then be responsive to whatever your questions might be. And they teach evolution at almost all evangelical colleges and seminaries. Almost all born-again colleges, they teach evolution. Well, while I was there, the first day I walked into class, the teacher held up the textbook that we were going to use, and I had used that same textbook four years earlier at the University of Miami, Florida, before I went and joined the Army. And I, I knew that, that that textbook taught evolution. And I just, I stormed out of class, went to the registrar's office, slammed the door, went to, the, you know, just withdrew from the course. And I told my sweet mate, Satan obviously has a foothold in this school, you know. <laughs> well, how I shifted was that Several of my, prof all of the professors believed in evolution, and they were clearly godly men and women. And some of the, more, some of the juniors and seniors at the, at, at the college were also clearly living Christ-like lives and were deeply committed Christians, yet they also believed in evolution. So I no longer had the belief that if you believed in evolution, you weren't a committed Christian. If you did believe in evolution, that, you know, I, mean, you know, I never had that dichotomy. But the other thing, and I'll mention this, the other thing that made a big difference was that I met a Buddhist Christian. Now, my worldview didn't allow for the possibility of being a Buddhist Christian. Like, I didn't know how to make sense of that. Here was a guy who had graduated from Harvard University, graduated with a degree in Buddhist philosophy, went to India, taught Buddhism in India, but he had, a, he had an internal bleeding, and a Catholic, Roman Catholic priest convinced him to pray for healing. He prayed and was healed. So he didn't stop being a Buddhist, but he now expanded to also include Catholicism. So he came back to this country, back to the States, became a Trappist monk like Thomas Merton, and was a monk for seven years, and then went to Yale Divinity School, got his Master of Divinity, and was now back as a lay Catholic chaplain. That is, he wasn't a priest, he was getting married, but he was a Catholic chaplain. And he called himself a Buddhist Christian, and he was totally into evolution. So my theology at that time, because again, I'm a born-again, conservative Christian, anti-evolutionary, my worldview said he's going to hell, get him saved, <laughs> okay? But my heart said, he's the most Christ-like man I'd ever met. 
And I had literally never met anybody more loving, more thoughtful, more compassionate, more selfless. So my worldview said he's going to hell, get him saved. My heart said, would you please mentor me? I mean, that's what I wanted to ask him. And that conflict between my head and my heart, ultimately my heart won out and I kept, my, my worldview kept expanding. And so part of it was rational in that I began to see that all truth is God's truth and that evolution could simply be, you know, the way God's been creating for 14 billion years. And now I do believe that strongly. The evidence for me is compelling. Um, but I also had a person, an individual, that embodied this evolutionary spirituality. And yet here there was a guy that considered himself both Buddhist and Christian, and I didn't even know how to do that. Well, I was raised Roman Catholic, but uh, didn't feel called to celibacy, wanted to be married and have kids. And so I ended up becoming a Protestant minister and was a, a pastor of three churches. I pastored three churches from the mid-90s, the mid-80s to the mid-90s. I pastored three different congregations, one in uh, western Massachusetts, one in southeast Ohio, and then one in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In fact, my, I've got a daughter that's uh, 14 years old up in Ann Arbor. She's in ninth grade, uh, lives with her form my, uh, my former wife, her, her mom. And um, after pastoring for three churches, well, actually, in 1989, I was introduced to this universe story perspective. I was introduced to an understanding of the whole universe and our relationship to it that made so much sense to me, that so touched my heart that I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life popularizing this perspective. It was like this appointment with destiny kind of thing. It was like, whoa, I got to do this. And so I've been studying it ever since, since 1988. After pastoring three churches, I also worked with Jewish rabbis, Roman Catholic priests, Protestant clergy, and evangelical clergy all around the United States on key environmental issues that were coming up for a vote in Congress. I, I was the religious organizer for the National Environmental Trust based in Washington, D.C. And then for five years after that, basically what I did was I helped neighbors. I was the head of the first government-funded sustainable lifestyle campaign in the United States. My, what I did was my job, I mean, check this job out. My job was to get neighbors to get to know each other better and build trust and a sense of community among each other as neighbors by supporting each other in living more earth-friendly lifestyles, more stewardship-based lifestyles. Basically, I help people support each other in using less water, driving less, composting, recycling, you know, a living a more uh, environmentally friendly life. And then I met Connie, my wife, about uh, three years ago. And we, uh, we've been uh, on the road now for two and a half years, and it's this message that compels us. So before I even go any further, what I'd love to hear from you is what are some of the questions that you have related to science and religion or theology and God and kind of evolution and kind of how this stuff works? Because I want to be responsive to some of your questions. So let's just take just a couple minutes. Just, and, and I won't respond to each question. I'll just hear your questions and that'll give me a sense of, of how to, to, to uh, tone our time together. And that's actually, your questions are actually related. I'll show you how. Other questions, and it just, it doesn't even have to make sense, just any question you've had in the past about science and religion or ecology and God or sustainability or whatever. Yeah? Like certain stories in the Bible, you don't coincide with something like double So like stories in the Bible, yeah, how do they fit with science or how do they fit with our understanding of the universe, yeah, great, yes? Yeah, great. If we, did, if we evolved from other apes, why is it that we don't see them evolving into like humans now? Great. Any other questions? I mean, obviously you can ask questions at any time, but just uh, any questions? Yeah. Um, also, do, is there any belief that there could possibly be life on other planets? And the question about the possibility, of, yeah, the possibility of life on other planets and that sort of thing. Great. Come on, there's got to be a few more questions out there. Yes? Um, I don't really understand how you can believe in like, both evolution and like, the theory of evolution and like, religious. Yeah, how do, you, how do I do... Because what I say is I'm an evolutionary creationist. Now, how do I do that? Yeah, be glad to. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'm going to... I'll just jump in, and then if you have a question at any time, feel free to ask it, okay? Um, first, let me go ahead and touch on the question, like, how, how is it that people, why is it that some people are very threatened? I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to assume that all of you believe in evolution. I'm going to assume that some of you do, some of you don't. Some of you are kind of, like, wondering about it, that, that you're probably all over the map. 
because that's pretty true of, of our culture. So one of the reasons why I'll speak for myself, why I was very threatened by the evolutionary perspective, was that while I, while I grew up in the church, I never had a, like a really deeply committed relationship to God or to Christ. And I made that commitment in my late teenage years. I was in the army. And I made a very strong commitment. And at that point, the people that surrounded me, the people that I was being fed by, the, people, the books I read, the people I hung out with, the preaching and the teaching that I got, was very strongly Bibly oriented, strong, everything that was strong in the Bible, but, they, but science was not really considered important. In fact, some of it was considered threatening. So that's what I, why, what I was eating through my eyes, through my mind, you know, I was mentally eating. And so we, what we eat, what we feed on, becomes a part of how we see the world. And so for me at the time, I believed in the late 1970s, I believed that Jesus was coming back any day, the end of the world was going to happen, and we would never see, or the, see the year 2000. I was quite positive that we would never see the year 2000. Now here we are in 2004. I think the reason many conservatives, conservative Catholics and conservative Protestants, as well as conservative Jews and conservative Muslims, are threatened by evolution is that the only form of evolution they've been exposed to, it's kind of like your question, how can you hold the two? The only form of evolution that many conservatives, many strongly religious people have been exposed to is a chance, meaningless, purposeless, mechanistic, godless process. In other words, a process that's not going anywhere, that's not sacred, and that God's nowhere in the picture. So if I was a conservative and I believed that, that, that you know, Jesus was my Lord or I made that commitment or I believed that the Bible was true or whatever, however my religious beliefs, if I didn't find God anywhere in the teaching of evolution, well, I wasn't exactly going to embrace evolution. I'd always, I'd kind of hold it some of it, you know, I'd think about some of it, but I couldn't embrace, it wasn't like I was going to enthusiastically embrace it. Until evolution, and when I say evolution, all I'm meaning is the history of the universe. So until the 14 billion year history of the universe can be taught and told in a sacred way, in a God glorifying way, in a Christ edifying way, in a scripture honoring way, I think many conservatives are not going to accept evolution. And they shouldn't. They shouldn't be expected. Strong religious people who don't find evolution <coughs> praising God, who don't find evolution as a way that helps them live a more Christ-like life, shouldn't embrace evolution. See, I still don't understand that, though, because aren't we taught religiously that God has a reason for everything? And that if he purposely made it in like a step-by-step -step way, he did that on purpose for us. So sure. But there are some people that don't believe that that's the way that God made it. Some people believe that God made, this is the way I used to believe, that God made everything at the beginning of time in the kind of the way that I would make this. Or I made this. In other words, you know, you make it and then it just, it's just, it just kind of stays there. It's just there. And God made creation kind of like a potter makes a, you know, makes a pot. Or a watchmaker makes a watch. Or a table maker makes a table. That's the way many people have thought of creation. That God made creation as an external thing to himself. So he's out here. He makes this table. And there's creation. And it just sits there. Most of human history, that's the way we had the understanding. Another way of thinking about it now is that God made the universe, God, I, this is the way I think about it, and this is just, this is just, I mean, if, if you don't like this way, you don't have to buy it, but, but I love this. That God planted the, the universe smaller than a mustard seed in God's own heart. In other words, God planted the universe within God's own heart, and it's been expanding ever since in the heart of God. In other words, nothing happens outside the heart of God. God's heart includes everything. Nothing can possibly happen outside the heart of God. And so what that does is it allows me to embrace science, for example, because what science talks about is an evolving universe that began smaller than this, and what we call the Big Bang has been expanding, and it's becoming more complex. First, the universe started out in simple atoms. Well, actually, before there was any atoms, it was just hot, dense energy, and it was real small. And then it expanded. At one point, the whole universe was this big, and then this big, and this big. And it happened very fast, but as the universe expanded, it started becoming more complex. So the first atoms that formed, you know, if you all, I'm assuming you've seen the periodic table of elements, okay? All the atoms that were formed in the periodic table of elements, only hydrogen was formed at the beginning of time. The simplest atom was formed at the beginning of time, okay? All the other atoms were formed inside stars. See, we now know how God created the very atoms. In fact, here's a, 
Here's an updated periodic table of elements. This shows where the chemical elements were formed. At the beginning of time, there was just hydrogen, in fact, right after the Big Bang, or what we call the, see, we don't even like the term Big Bang. Because, because Big Bang, I mean, it makes it sound like we're shrapnel, you know? That we call it the Great Radiance. It's the beginning of everyone and everything. So at the Great Radiance, you've got just hydrogen, and then helium is formed by stars. Actually, there was a little bit maybe at the beginning of time, but you know what, our sun, when we look outside and look at the sun, we're actually looking at a great ball of hydrogen gas that's converting to helium. Four atoms at a time are coming together, pressed together, and the energy, it, force, it becomes helium, and the energy that's released is what powers a star. That's what our sun is, is a bunch of hydrogen becoming helium. Inside red giant stars, big stars like our sun, our sun will actually become a red giant at the end of its life. It will create carbon. Our sun is only big enough to create carbon. But inside slightly larger stars, they also create nitrogen and oxygen. So again, on the periodic table of elements, you've got carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And these are formed inside red giant stars. Okay? In fact, there's probably a picture. This right here is a picture of a red giant star. This is, we can measure how much carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are being formed here. Inside blue-white stars, really large, 8 to 20 times the size of our sun, so we're talking really large, all these other atoms, all the other periodic table of elements, all these other elements are formed inside blue-white stars. And then what happens is, the hotter it gets, it creates more and more complex atoms, and then it hits iron. And when it hits iron, what happens is the star then, see, iron doesn't produce energy. It requires energy, so it stops exploding outward. Well, imagine you've got this huge, unbelievably large ball of gas that's exploding out, and of course, gravity's trying to bring it in. So those two forces are equal, right? You've got the explosion out and gravity coming in. Well, all of a sudden, now it stops exploding out, because iron doesn't. So now it implodes. It collapses down on itself. And when that happens, all these other, uh, if you have any gold or silver, any metals are formed in the, the last instant of a collapsed supernova star. That then explodes, and that's what this picture is. This is a picture of an exploded supernova star with all these other atoms. So we now know how God created the atoms. God created the, the hydrogen at the very beginning of time. God created carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen inside red giant stars. And God created all the other atoms inside <coughs> supernova stars. And we know this with the same certainty that we know that the sun and the moon and the stars do not all go around us, but only the moon does. The sun and the stars don't go around us, we go around the sun. Most of human history, we thought differently. In fact, for 99.99% of human history, people, in fact, they didn't even just believe that the sun and the stars went around us, they knew it. It was like, Go outside and look. Duh, of course the sun and stars go around us. It's like anybody can see it, right? The sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. So now we know that that looks like that because the earth is turning and we're going around. So we have an, a new way of understanding this. In fact, this picture here, can you all see this? This is the Andromeda galaxy. This picture is our closest neighbor galaxy. In fact, I'm sure you've seen those... Um, T-shirts. I sometimes wear this, but I didn't. I didn't wear it today. But you've seen these before. You know, kind of like you are here. Okay. Now, obviously, we haven't gotten outside the Milky Way galaxy to take a picture of it. So this is not a digital picture of the of the Milky Way galaxy. This is a, a uh, computer generated image. So it's like this is where where the little dot is right there. Is where our sun would be in relationship to the rest of the Milky Way. This is another galaxy. This is our closest neighbor galaxy. This is two million light years away. So young Earth creationists, people who say that, the Earth, the whole, that God created the whole universe only 6,000 years ago, have a very difficult time explaining how it is that this is two million light years away. What that means is it's taken light traveling 11 million miles a minute. Okay, light travels really fast. 11 million miles in one minute, two million years to reach our eyes, to reach the photographic plates of this picture. Now, when I was a conservative Christian, what I believed was that Satan just made it look like that, that actually it was just meant to deceive us. Well, some people still believe that. I believe that it's far more accurate to say God's been creating the whole thing, or the whole thing's been expanding within the heart of God, and the whole thing 
is a record of God's love and creativity. See, that's the thing. I see the entire universe story, the scientific story of the universe, as the story of God's love, God's creativity, God's communication, and God's redemption that God has been redeeming throughout. And what I mean by that is there's consistent breakdowns, there's chaos, there's violence, there's destruction. There's all kinds of bad news that happens in the universe. It's kind of like our own lives, you know, sometimes things just go bad. And yet, when you look at the whole history of the universe, on the other side of all these chaos and these breakdowns is this unleashing of new creativity, new possibilities. So God is constantly taking bad news, taking Good Friday experiences, and turning them into Easter Sunday experiences, you could say. Yeah. Yeah, how do we know that the stars, great question. The question is, how do we know what stars are made up of? <coughs> Each element, like hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, that has its own, what they call signature. That is, on the light spectrum, you know when light goes through a prism, you've got all the different colors? Well, every element shows up at great distances somewhere on the light, on the prism, kind of like on the, the spectrum of light. And we can actually determine, for example, in, um, in this picture here, we now have the human technology to not only tell that carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are being, but we can tell how, what percentage of this gas is carbon, what percentage is oxygen, and what percentage in, is nitrogen, because it, they each have their own signature on the, on the light spectrum. By so, it, so by sending light through the it, star? Well, yeah, well, actually, it's sending its own light. I mean, oh. yeah, it's, it's, it's generating its own, but yes. Yeah. Like, if you said that you didn't get out of the Milky Way to take a picture of that galaxy, how did you take that one? Yeah. This is a picture. Uh, the question was, I'll go ahead and repeat the questions for the people in the back. If we haven't gotten outside the Milky Way galaxy to take a picture of it, how do we get a picture of this galaxy? Let's, let's pretend that this is an accurate picture, okay? So here we are. This is our sun, okay? And we're on planet Earth, the third planet out from that sun, and we're looking around, okay? So we've got our telescopes, and we're looking in all directions. Well, until 1924, our best scientists in the world thought that the whole universe was what we today know as the Milky Way galaxy. So we thought everything in the whole universe was the Milky Way galaxy. Then in 1924, there was a new telescope that was much larger than any previous telescope. And it was put down in the Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California. And there was a guy by the name of Edwin Hubble. You've heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, right? Well, this is named after him. Edwin Hubble was an astronomer. And Hubble had this new, brand new, big telescope. And what he was able to do was focus on these little nebula. They called them nebula. They, they, were, they looked like little blotches. They weren't stars. They were kind of fuzzier than stars, bigger. But with his new telescope, he could see this. And he could see, oh my goodness, this is not just a star or a blotch, this is a galaxy, and these are all stars within the galaxy. So we now know, for example, that if this is the Milky Way galaxy, okay, so let's say my hand is the Milky Way, here's Andromeda galaxy, okay, and then there's all these other galaxies. What we've discovered scientifically is that the universe is like some 100 to 200 billion galaxies, and that's why I want to introduce this picture. This picture is called the Hubble Deep Field Photo, okay? And let me, tell you, let me tell you how they got this picture, okay? If you took a piece of sand and put it on your finger and held it up, and you'd imagine just a, a beam of, you know, like kind of thin razor thing going through your eye, through that grain of sand, and out to the, to the stars, that's how much space, really teeny, like, in fact, the way I've heard it described, if you took an eight-foot straw, Okay, a straw like you drink soda out of that's eight foot long and you try to look through it, that's how much space that it's looking at. And they focused the Hubble Space Telescope on a little black spectrum of space. They couldn't see anything. From all the Earth-based telescopes, they couldn't see anything. So it looked like it was just completely blank. And they focused for 10 days. They kept the lenses open for 10 days so that even the furthest, faintest light would show up. And this is the picture that showed up. Now, this is a, is a star in the Milky Way galaxy, this dot here. Every other dot, no matter how small, no matter how large, all the other dots in this picture are galaxies. They're all galaxies like this, but whereas Andromeda galaxy is two million light years away, some of these are eight and nine and ten billion light years away. So much further. In other words, we're seeing these as they were eight and nine and ten billion years ago. 
Because when we look out into space, I'll call you in a second. When we look out into space, the further out we look, the further back in time we see. Telescopes are time machines. I want to say one other thing about the, the, the young earth creationist thing. When I believed that the earth was only about 6,000 years old, when I believed like, that the Genesis story told the literal truth about how the, you know, how the world was formed, I didn't know. I didn't know that now, for example, we now have evidence. Do you know what ice cores are? Where they, where they dig a, a hole in ice that's really far deep and then they bring it up and you can see it's kind of like rings of a tree. You know, if you've, ever, if you've ever seen a tree that was cut down, you've got the rings, okay? We have ice cores 400,000 years, where every year we can see 400,000 years of ice. So we know that the Earth, for example, is at least 400,000 years old. I mean, that we have that, that much evidence. We actually, the Earth is about 4.5, 4.5 billion years old. And we know that through several different ways. Now, you had a question? Um, since you can see all those galaxies, do you, does that make it possible that there could be like another, like there could be life on those and yeah, great question. The question, since we can see other galaxies, not just our close, now again, how, you know how many solar systems, that is suns with planets going around them? There could be billions of, of, of there, there are billions of suns. In fact, there's like 100 billion suns. And how many of them have planets going around them? We don't know, but probably quite a few. So right now, our scientists just, now this is, see, this is something that is for your generation, you guys have, we didn't have this one in my generation. We now have cataloged, we now can see that there are at least 140 solar systems with planets. When I was your age, we didn't know one. We, we thought we were the only solar system. We, we suspected there were probably other planets, but we didn't know it other than the ones in our solar system. We now have seen planets or we've seen stars that wobble in a certain way that they, the only way they could wobble in that way is that they have planets. So we now know that there's at least 140 other solar systems and every Really, almost every day we're discovering more. But the question about other life, life on other planets and stuff, this is the current thinking. Okay, I'm gonna now give you like the cutting edge thinking in the scientific community. That, that many, the, the majority of scientists are starting to say, yep, this seems likely. It seems that bacteria life, the simplest, most, most simple form of bacteria, are probably fairly common. We don't know this for certain yet, but we think that bacteria, so for example, even here in our solar system, you know how we've gone to Mars and we're trying to find out if there's life on Mars? Chances are they will discover life on Mars, but not on the surface of Mars, but about a half a mile down in, because that's probably where life evolved first, even on, on Earth here, okay? Where God created, and whenever I use the word God, what I'm meaning is the whole of reality, okay? Where God created Adam, life first on Earth was deep down in, so that's probably the case in other places. And in terms of life that's become so complex that the life can begin to think about itself, which is who we are, we don't know. It's possible that in many places in different galaxies that life has achieved that degree of complexity. And so there's a whole project where we're examining, we're trying to listen for radio waves, we're trying to listen for radio signals to try to determine are there other intelligent life forms out there. Many people think that we will find that, but we haven't yet. Personally, I think it's quite likely that the universe has been expanding and becoming more, because what we do know for certain is this. The universe has been expanding, and as it's been expanding, it's gone from simple atoms to more complex atoms, to more complex atoms, to molecules, to more complex molecules, to creatures, to more complex creatures. And I'm doing this with my hands because the whole thing is expanding. When, when the universe, when creation produced a creature complex enough that it could begin to see, for example, eyesight. I mean, imagine a world before eyesight. I mean, okay, everybody close your eyes just a second, okay? So here it is, it's completely dark, there's no eyesight, there's no, no creatures that can see, there's nothing that can see. And then the first creatures that can become sensitive to light, just slowly open your eyes, just imagine the awesomeness of creation beginning to see itself. Now again, remember, all of this is happening within the heart of God. So the universe begins to become aware of itself. And that's, l let me use an analogy. Do you know what a zygote is? A zygote, we all began as a zygote. It's a fertilized egg. When a sperm and an egg come together, that fertilized egg is called a zygote. Okay? Now that zygote, it's how all of us began. That zygote is, 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 is it's, it's a living cell. 
Now that cell starts to double and double and double and double and double and double and double, and double all within the one. So it stays one, it's one body, but it now becomes differentiated. So some cells become eye cells, some cells become ear cells, some cells become butt cells, some cells become knee cells. I mean, you know, all the different parts of our body, right? Well, when you were in your mother's womb and you could begin to distinguish light and dark, like whatever month that was, or let's say when you were in your mother's womb and you could begin to hear at whatever month that is, three, four, five months, it's you, the child, that's seeing or hearing. We don't say, well, do you think her eye cells are seeing now? Or, you know, do you think her ear cells are hearing? And we don't talk that way. It's you, it's the child that's seeing and hearing, right? Well, so too, what we call the universe, which is, you know, what, you know what the Greek's name for the universe was? Cosmos. Capital K, proper name, not the cosmos, little c, like the chair, the chair, the cosmos, no. Cosmos, like a personal name, an I-thou relationship. They believed the cosmos was a living being that they were a part of, which is actually more scientifically true than thinking of it as the cosmos. But in any case, creation, cosmos, nature, the universe is becoming more complex. So the first creatures they could see, it was literally the universe coming to see itself. The first creatures that could hear, it was literally cosmos, it was nature, it was creation coming to experience itself in a, more new, in a new way. Human beings, literally, I'm speaking literally, human beings are the universe, cosmos, creation. After some 14 billion years of unbroken evolution, creation becomes complex enough that it can begin to contemplate itself. Human beings are literally the universe becoming aware of itself. That's who you are right now, sitting here. You're, the, you're a cell in the body of the universe. You're a cell in the body of creation coming to know itself. We didn't come into this world. In fact, if you don't hear anything else I say, please hear this. We didn't come into this world, and we weren't placed here. We grew out of it. We grew out of the world. In the same way that an apple grows out of an apple tree. I mean, if you want to know how God made humans, God planted a seed, smaller than a mustard seed, in God's own heart, and it's been expanding and becoming more complex, and after 14 billion years, it began producing human beings. And that's how God created us. Human beings, in fact, a, a human being looking through a telescope is literally the universe looking at itself and going, wow. A biology student, like when you're in biology class, have you ever used a microscope? A biology student looking through a microscope is the planet Earth learning with awareness how it's functioned unconsciously and instinctually for billions of years? Hang on just a second. Just do one second. We didn't come into this world, we grew out of it. And when the Bible, for example, speaks about God forming us from the dust of the ground and breathing into us the breath of life, when Genesis 2 7 speaks that way, that's a true story. It's saying the truth that we grow out of the dynamics of the planet itself and it's the divine creative reality of the whole personified as God that makes that possible. Let me give you two quotes from Brian Swim and then I'll take a couple of questions. Brian Swim is a physicist friend of ours and he says this. He says, four billion years ago the earth was molten rock and now it sings rock and roll. Earth sings rock and roll. Earth sings opera through us. Here's, here's Brian Swim's way of summing up the entire story of the universe. For a 14 billion year story in two sentences. You take a great cloud of hydrogen gas and you just leave it alone. And it becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and human beings. And that's what science is telling us. And that can be told in God glorifying, Christ edifying, scripture honoring ways. Questions? You had one. Do they have any evidence that other um, solar systems might be ahead of us? Do they have evidence that other solar systems might be ahead of us? Not yet. We don't have that evidence, but it cer certainly could be. Yeah. So did God create everything else without Makes sense to me. I mean, if God is infinite, if God is ultimate reality, I mean, do you know... Um, do you know nesting dolls, like, like Russian nesting dolls? Okay. God is that name, God is, the, is a proper name that we give to the, the ultimate nesting doll. That is that ultimate reality that includes all, all the realities, yet transcends all other realities. So in nesting dolls, like if you imagine, you know, 
atoms, within molecules, within cells, within organisms, within planets, within galaxies, all the way up and all the way down. God is that ultimate creative reality that includes it all. So yes, if there are other solar systems, if there are other planets, if there are other galaxies, all of it is held within, within God. And even if there's other universes, some people think, here's a really interesting theory. You've heard of black holes, right? Some people think on the other side of black holes are new universes being born. Well, even if that's true, which we don't know yet, but even if that's true, then clearly that's all a part of the creativity of God. Yeah. So if you made up the universe, then why would it, like, if you made the other If God, uh, help me understand the question, if God made other... If you made every single universe, then why wouldn't there be humans and other forms of life? Like, um, why wouldn't they all be the same? Well... Yeah, um, I don't know that I've got a good answer to that question because we just don't know yet. I mean, for example, if, why did God make dinosaurs that then went extinct? I mean, why did God, why, why does any form of life come into being, it's around for a while, and then it goes extinct? And ultimately, I mean, if, if God is a personification, if God is, a, is at least, I mean, God may be infinitely more than this, but if God is at least a personification of the whole of reality, measurable and non-measurable, seen and unseen, in other words, transcendent and imminent. If that's at least what God is, then we may never know why God does things. In other words, why did certain things get created? Why didn't other things get created? Why have things been evolving the way we are? I don't know that we can know that. It, at least I don't know it. <laughs> you know. But I do know that I can give God glory. That is, I can celebrate the whole. I can actually cherish and reverence the whole creativity. And here's the bottom line for me. I mean, why Connie and I have committed our lives to living on the road? I mean, that's a pretty radical thing to do. I mean, you know, to live your life traveling all around. Like, why on earth would we be so silly to do that? Why we do that is that what we're committed to is what our mentor, Thomas Berry, calls the great work. You could say every culture has its great work to do. It's kind of the collective calling of that time. My way of describing the great work of our time, our way of describing the great work of our time, is it's the work of ensuring a just, healthy, beautiful, and sustainably life-giving world for future generations of all species, and to furthering what God's been up to for 14 billion years. In other words, how do we work for a just, healthy, beautiful, and sustainably life-giving world, and do so to the glory of God? And in doing so, we're furthering what God's been doing. Like this creativity that God has been about for 14 billion years, how do we further that? Because the creativity of God is going in a direction. The direction of evolution is in greater cooperation. This is, again, one of the more important things I'm going to say today. The direction of evolution is in the direction of greater cooperation, greater intimacy with itself, and greater interdependence at larger and wider scale. So how do we help human beings cooperate? How do we help human beings work together in this way? And I think that's one of the fundamentally exciting questions. Yeah. Um, if you believe that Jesus came to this world, then do we believe that Jesus would have gone to other worlds too? Do I, if I believe that Jesus came to this world, do I believe that Jesus came to other worlds? First of all, that kind of language, that Jesus came to earth, I don't believe. Jesus, like us, grew out of the earth. Jesus was a cell in the body. But Jesus knew it. He got his relationship to the whole. He got that he, and he was one with the Father. And he lived out of that integrity, out of that compassion, out of that power, out of that authenticity. And so all the people around him said, like, do you know, have you ever met a guy like this? I mean, this guy clearly embodies God. I mean, what's up? And so they, they recognized that here in this man, Jesus of Nazareth, there was a unique expression of the holy, of the whole. And he lived out of that. So no, uh, if, other, if there are other planets with other life forms and other intelligences, my sense is that there would be other, other intelligent creatures, heartful creatures that would emerge in those planets that would be like Jesus for those settings like Jesus was here for us. Yeah. So do you think Mary wasn't a virgin then? Do I think Mary wasn't a virgin? The, the virgin Mary. For me to, okay, where's, see these things here? All of the, the major concepts of Christianity, th these are just some of them right here. Um, I've actually got a whole bunch more 
on here kind of the, the, what I call the ABCs of evolutionary Christianity. In fact, let me go ahead and just leave this up for a minute. Um, I don't know what to do with this. There we go. Um, all the major Christian concepts or categories, I mean, here I've got them ABCs, you know, Adam and Eve, angels, apostles, accountability, uh, the apocalypse, and then B, Bible. I'm not going to go through all these, baptism. But, but you see here with V, I've got virgin birth. Over here, I've got the same thing, but these are some of the, some of the I mean, that's an overwhelming list there. Here are some of the, the major core concepts of Christianity. Whether Mary was a virgin, like a literal virgin, like she had never, ever been sexual with anybody ever before, and she got impregnated with Jesus, which many people believe, or whether that's a story that was designed to teach people that Jesus was truly of God, which other people believe, more liberals believe. For me, neither one of those, in other words, if somebody wants to believe that Jesus was a literal virgin and others that don't believe that literally, I don't, it doesn't matter, I'm not interested in arguing with people over their beliefs. For me, beliefs aren't the important thing. The important thing in, in terms of having the right beliefs, and I realize that in a Catholic context, I mean, I grew up Roman Catholic. I went to a Catholic school for eight years. Having the right beliefs was something that was very important, both then and, as a, and you know, later on when I became a Protestant minister. So what I'm interested in is how can these concepts be understood to be eternally true? Like what is the, vir what is the story of the virgin birth saying about all of us at all times? What does death and resurrection say for all of us at all times? Heaven and hell, angels, demons, uh, the, the cross, all these major core concepts, how can these be understood in a scientific way that gives us a bigger understanding? See, when the Bible was written, people believed the world was flat, stationary, there was a dome heavens. You know how people understood stars when, God was, when, when, when Jesus was walking the earth? Do you know how people understood stars? Not like we do today. The stars were the pinprick holes in the canopy, the dome of the heavens that allowed God's glory to shine through. In fact, Bruno, Bru Gordiano Bruno was burned at the stake only 400 years ago. In 1600, exactly the year 1600, he was burned at the stake. And you know what his heresy was? You know why the church killed him? Here was his heresy. He said that stars are probably suns like ours very far away and some of them have planets going around them. He was killed for that. That was so heretical, so threatening. Okay? So with regards to these concepts, I believe they're all eternally true. So for example, the story of the virgin birth for me is an eternally true story. That is, it's always, it's not about time, it could be, but it's about every moment. So for example, how does God's creativity birth through any one of us? Where does it come from? We don't know. It comes from God. So if you want to believe or anybody else wants to believe in the virgin birth literally, I say, praise God, no problem. But if somebody doesn't believe in the birth, virgin birth literally, it's not going to make a difference. Follow your own conscience. With regards to not just the virgin birth, but with regards to any of these concepts. Because ultimately, what it's about isn't having the right beliefs. It's about following the risen Christ in your heart so that you can be guided by love, by the incarnational love of the universe to co-create with God. Yeah. I know, like, in DNA, sometimes there's, like, glitches and things go wrong with Turner Syndrome and all the other syndromes we have. Like, I know that doesn't fit perfectly in, like, how things are playing out. Like, how would that fit in with religion? Sure. Yeah, how, how do we explain the fact that things goof up, things get screwed up, that there's problems, there's things like cancer and, and you know, uh, Down syndrome and things like that. One of the things that sometimes people wonder is like, is the universe determined, like everything that happens in the universe, because God says this is what I want, this is what I want, okay, yep, yep, yep this is, so God is like pre-programming everything. Some people think that. And other people think, oh no, it's all chance. It's just all just chance. It's just all just, you know, kind of like, random. The truth of the matter, it's creative. And creativity has an element that's, that's, that has to be. And there's an element of freedom. There's an element of just chance. And both are a part of the universe. And so at all levels of the universe, when you look at the entire history of the universe, one of the things that we notice is that there are these, um, these breakdowns, things go wrong, things go bad, chaos happens. 
asteroids hit, dinosaurs die out, all kinds of interesting stuff. Sometimes genetic things go wrong genetically and you've got different diseases and whatever. And how do we explain that? And my way of explaining it is that that is a part of the nature of nature. I mean, cancer happens in animals too, so it's not just you know, the result of human sinning or whatever. We find it in, in the animal world and plants. But that bad news, see, who, is, who suffers first? God does. See, God is the whole. God holds the whole within his heart. And so any creature that suffers, and I'm not even talking humans, any animal that suffers, God feels it first. Because so oftentimes we think of a God's eye view of the world as a view from above and outside it all. You know, the kind of like the view like outside, that, that's a God's eye view. Well, no. I mean, actually, yes, that's true. But a God's eye view is also the view from within every set of eyes. Within the dragonfly's eyes, within the dolphin's eyes, within the whale's eyes. Even the chameleon, you know, who has two eyes that go like this. <laughs> Even that is a part of a God's eye view of the world. God includes all of it. So I can't explain why things go bad or why certain syndromes are there, you know. But I know this, that God is infinite love and infinite compassion. And God is the first who feels all of our suffering. We'll cover more of this when we, after, we, after we break, come back from, from the lunch. So, what I'd like to do, at, uh, or at least begin to do in our r remaining half hour together, is sometimes people wonder, like, why is there differences among religions and how did different religions come into being and, and especially I mean for myself for the longest time I believed that there was one true religion mine and if you differed then you were wrong and you might even be in danger of hell and so what I'd like to do is share how religions evolved and how uh, we now have an understanding of the universe that allows us to cherish the truth of our tradition and also to cherish the truth of other people's traditions and how can we do that? So, um, If you take a mainstream evolutionary perspective, human beings have existed, according to mainstream science, humans have existed for about two and a half million years. That is, we've been walking upright using stone tools, homo habilis. We domesticated fire about a million and a half years ago, that is, we learned to keep warm and cook. Yet we've only had verbal speech, we've only had symbolic speech where I say, you know, chocolate mousse or chocolate sundae or something and you can know what I'm talking about. The sound that I make is an auditory symbol for what you're hearing. We've had that kind of language for 100, 200,000 years. What that means is that for 80 to 90 percent of human history, we related to the whole of reality with the same intimacy that all other creatures do. I mean, how imagine how do any animals relate to reality? Well, they, they seek after that which they're hungry for, they uh, mate with that which they're attracted to, they keep warm, they keep safe, they keep uh, the, the, you know, the shelter from the rain and things like that, and, that's the, and, and they, they teach their young. And that's what we did as human beings. And then we start naming our world, we start putting these words that are symbols. You see here I've got, these are what I call seven great post-biblical revelations. Now I'm not going to go through the details of all of them right now. But the first is just simply that evolution understood in a sacred way, that is a God-glorifying way, is a grand unifying and empowering worldview. That is, it unifies science and religion and helps us uh, reconcile different religions. And language is symbolic, it's meaningful, and it's consequential. That is, it's, it makes a difference what we, what we say and what we think. So here's the piece about language being symbolic. That is, when I use words, I'm using symbols. Imagine before any human language, okay, there's, there's human beings, because humans have existed for two and a half million years, yet we've only had verbal speech for maybe 100,000, 200,000 years. What that means is for 80 to 90 percent of human history, we related to the whole of reality with the same intimacy that all other creatures do. And when we start using words and naming our world, we start putting labels. Okay, this is this is that. And we start putting these labels called words on our world. And of course, if we're over here living in a harsh desert climate, and we're over here living in a lush tropical climate, and we're over here living in a northern climate, we're living in different worlds. We don't even know about each other's world. It's not the same world from our perspective. Now, of course, it's the same globe, but we don't know about that. In fact, most of human history, people believe the world was flat. So the language that we use to describe reality 
is going to be different depending upon the different plants and the animals and different climates in which we live because the words that we're going to use are different. So for example, let's say we over here had never experienced sheep, lambs, you know, just not a part of our experience. Well, the Lamb of God would not be a part of our sacred story. If we over here had never experienced the political reality of a king, the kingdom of God would not be a part of our sacred story. Lotus blossoms would, or whatever other thing, I mean, like as in Hinduism. So for example, every religion makes sense given the different life regions in which they emerged. For example, Hindus. Hindus have all of these different gods and goddesses. Now if you ask a Hindu, do they literally believe that there's different gods and goddesses outside the universe? They do not. What they mean is that nature is divine and it shows up with a multiplicity of divine faces. Hinduism never could have, it just couldn't have possibly emerged in Palestine, which is a very harsh climate. But Judaism couldn't have emerged in India either. All religions make sense given their different regions. And we use analogies or metaphors to describe anything we can't sense with our senses. I mean, if I'm trying to, like say you've never experienced this before, like you've never seen one of these before, and I said, do you know what a stool is? And, stool, what's a stool? And I put this out, and I take it, and you, you feel it, you go, okay, you get your own sense of what a sitting stool is like, okay? Stool to sit on, okay? Well, if I'm trying to describe something to you, like have you ever heard of Grogglebod? You say, what's a Grogglebod? and there's no grogglebods around to like experience it, I have to use an analogy. I say, oh, well, a grogglebod is like, and then I say something that a grogglebod is like. Okay, now I'm just obviously making this up. But if I'm talking about God or the universe or any grand concept that you can't just sense with your senses, I have to use an analogy or a metaphor. So earlier cultures, the earliest cultures, um, like say hunter-gatherers, before any human beings started settling down and farming, so human beings were just hunting and gathering, and, and, you know, there was no farming. No, farming had never been invented. In those kind of cultures, the analogies for what ultimate reality are like typically take on the different plants and animals. So, for example, some Native American cultures spoke about the creator is a trickster, like a fox or coyote. You know, you think things are going one way and all of a sudden, whoop! Surprise! You know, get used to it. You know, and isn't life that way? I mean, sometimes life just throws us a curveball and it's like we've got to get used to it. Then what we see is when we start settling into, into these valleys, humans now, not just hunting and gathering, moving around, but they start settling in and farming, not with plows, but just digging in the ground with a stick in these rich, fertile valleys. And this is horticultural. And in horticultural societies, that is societies that dig in the ground with a stick, most of the images, in, according to the research I've read, 93% of horticultural societies have, have feminine images for what ultimate reality is like. There's the goddess, the earth mother. Now, it's, they don't believe, horticultural societies, people that speak about the goddess, don't believe that there's a female god beyond the clouds somewhere. It's that nature is feminine-like. Nature is divine and feminine. It's sometimes severe, beautiful, wonderful, awesome, abundant, provides all things, whatever, but it's feminine-like, mother-like. Well then, when writing develops, and there's actually a book called The Alphabet Versus the Goddess that deals with this. It was a bestseller for a few years. It was written by Leonard Schlein, who's a brain surgeon, who talks about how writing promotes left brain thinking, more patriarchal way of thinking. Well, when writing comes into a culture, so when now cultures are not, no longer transmitting information, like the, the sacred information, just through words and through stories and rituals, now the sacred information is transmitted through the book. So we start seeing cultures of the book. And this happened about 5,000 years ago was the beginning. And then we start seeing writing more and more. And then when the Hebrews, uh, about, uh, about three, three and a half, four thousand years ago, already by that time, there were strong cultures of the book. Well, when writing comes into a culture, we start seeing feminine images for reality beginning to slip away. And the male images for reality, that is ultimate reality, begin to be re replace them. We start now seeing reality being described and the creator or God being described as Lord, Father, King, Warrior, these strong male images. But again, it's reality that's being referred to. It's like life is fatherlike. The universe, God, rea reality is fatherlike. You know, you, you know, a nurturing father or a severe father or whatever, but that's what's being referred to, not a big daddy in the sky. Well, about five 
100 years ago, only a few hundred years ago, about 500 years ago, a new analogy, because again, to describe any grand concept, I have to have an analogy, right? If it's not sense, present to your senses. So a new analogy began to be used to describe ultimate reality 500 years ago. And the analogy was this, that of a clock. Now, not a wristwatch clock, but like a pendulum clock, okay? And, and we start seeing mechanistic metaphors, mechanistic analogies, and I say mechanistic, it's like a mechanism, it's something we make, as the analogy for what ultimacy is like. Now, ultimate reality is not mother or father, those are quaint. Reality is like a complex clock, and the more that we break it down into its component parts, we then think we understand the whole. In the way that I do this clock, for example, if, if I break down this clock into all its parts, and I take it all apart, and I know how the parts work together, and I know, you know all about them, I then understand the whole. It's like this watch is nothing but the sum of its parts. In fact, the TV, the computer, all human-made artifacts are nothing but the sum of its parts. That is, if you know about the parts and how they fit together and how they work together, you know about the whole thing. But atoms aren't like that. Cells are not like that. Galaxies are not like that. All living systems are not like that. That is, there's, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. I mean, I can take all the atoms the actual atomic elements of the human body and put them together and it's just a pile of atoms. There's something more about a living being that's more than the sum of its parts. So what we discovered is that the universe, that is reality is like that. Reality is more than the sum of its parts. That's, that's why I like, I like these nesting dolls, is that the universe is nested creativity subatomic particles within atoms, within molecules, within cells, within organisms. So it's like here we've got, you know, molecules are made up of atoms. But creatures are made up of molecules that are made up of atoms. And then planets are made up of creatures that are made up of molecules that are made up of atoms. And then galaxies are made up of, and you see, it goes on like that. And so the, the name that we give to the largest nesting doll, that ultimate infinite nesting doll, see, this is different because this has an ending. Okay, so this is, this is a poor analogy because this largest nesting doll ends here. Whereas God, there's no ending, it's just it's infinite. So if you imagine the, la the largest nesting doll being infinitely large and infinitely comprehensive, that reality holds everything else within and yet also transcends. So that's what we mean by the transcendence of God, that is, whatever we mean by God is going to transcend whatever we can know, think, or imagine. But God is also imminent. There's no place that God stops and something else starts. We're all cells in the body of a living planet that's a part of a living universe that's a part of a living God. Yeah? When, you, when I understand, I understand what your analogy is, like, don't get me wrong, but I mean, it's just normal for me. That makes me feel even farther away from God, even though, like, because like, I'm, if I'm that littlest cell and I keep getting bigger and bigger, then I feel like God's farther away from me. Okay. Isn't that not what we're supposed to feel? Yeah, l let, me, let me see if I can, uh, I can push that. From the mechanism, if I imagine that the whole universe is like a complex clock. So where's the only place that God can possibly exist if the universe is a complex clock? Outside the clock, right? Because, and the reason is because all clocks, all human-made things, like the creator that made this table is outside of it. The creator that made this computer is outside of it. The creator that made this watch is outside of it. So if the universe is like a big thing that God made, then God can only exist outside of it. It's not like that. See, that's the thing. God is like this great living being that all other beings are within God. And so prayer, see this is a great question. Prayer from the old, if I think the universe is like a complex clock, then prayer is petitioning. It's like asking this divine being, kind of a divine landlord, a supreme landlord who resides off the planet and outside the universe, to intervene in the world. So it's praying to a God that's outside the universe to, to intervene in the world. That to me isn't a very intimate way of understanding prayer. I now understand prayer because this is my understanding of the nature of reality like this, that prayer is like one of my heart cells communicating with the body of which it's a part. So we're all like cells in the body of God. And for me, that's a more intimate way of thinking about my relationship. Because what that also does is that for me to really be present to you, like to really be present to the uniqueness of you as a being, is part of what it means to worship God. It's cherishing our differences. I like that little thing with the fish there, with the one that's different. It's like cherishing our differences and recognizing that if I, if I love people, 
like genuinely, from the heart, really authentically love people, I'm loving God. If I genuinely care for the earth, if I, if I work for justice and for peace and for sustainability, I'm actually doing that as a prayer to God in the action. Like exactly, exactly. It's not just praying. Yeah? Also to comment on what she said, see, I believe because we're so different and we're not just a mass of self, like we actually have a personality. God created our personality. He created everything so we can develop our personality and that's how he's connected to us. Yeah. And then I also learned through something that because the universe is expanding, like there's actually more nothingness out there and we're just expanding and expanding that that's how we might become extinct or something so we'll just get further and further away from us. Yeah, that, that's, uh, l let me clarify that, because in fact, uh, planet Earth isn't in fact getting further from the sun, but the galaxies are expanding. So like the, the space in between, like here you've got a galaxy, okay, and here you've got a galaxy, and space is expanding in between the galaxies. So the galaxies do seem to be moving away, but again, all of this is happening within the heart of God. So as the galaxies expand, as the whole universe expands, it all expands within God's heart. And my way of describing kind of like where the whole thing is going, is that when you look at the whole history of the universe, it goes from simple atoms to more complex atoms to creatures to more complex creatures till finally it produces a creature complex enough that the universe can begin to know itself and that's who we are. Well, what's our technology doing? What, is, what does computer technology help us do? What does the internet help us to do? It helps us to connect and share information and share experience and share wisdom and communicate. And so we're now creating a new organism at a larger scale where human beings are like the, the metabolisms of that cell. And I think, the, this is just my theory, but I think the whole of creation is becoming more conscious. That the whole of creation is becoming more aware and more conscious and more conscious that it's a part of God's body and ultimately our destiny is to further that process until finally the whole universe recognizes itself as a revelation of God and gives God glory. I mean that's just my theory but that's the thing that makes sense both religiously and scientifically because it makes sense of scripture, it makes sense of my tradition and it makes total sense from this this evolutionary understanding that we now have through science. I didn't comment on this before but let me go ahead and just say something about it now. For most of human history, we didn't have an evolutionary understanding. That is a time developmental, a way that things are developing over time, that the whole universe is maturing. And we didn't have that understanding. So this is the different perspective. These are the different revelations from God's perspective. That is, they're a revealing of the truth from God's perspective. And from the perspective of science, from the perspective of the part to the whole, these are discoveries. You see how they're both? So from the perspective, where's my nesting dolls? From the perspective of the whole to the part, they're revelations. From the perspective of the part to the whole, they're discoveries. And both are true. So the red dots, along with the red words, have to do with the cultural discoveries or cultural revelations. The yellow dots have to do with the astronomical or the heavens, the stars, galaxies, things like that. The blue dots have to do with the earth sciences, like geology. And the green dots have to do with the biological sciences, like biology and things like that. And the asterisks are the major, this is where we've come to know something so, so significantly that we can say that it's factual, that there's something, like we don't just believe that the, that the, that the, uh, the plates, the crust of earth, that the continents are drifting around on plates. We know that, it's a fact. Uh, we don't just believe that extinction is real, that some animals that used to be here are no longer here, that they're now extinct. We now know that's a fact. But prior to this, we didn't know that as a fact. In fact, this was debated. In fact, let me tell you a cute story. George Cuvier, in 1796, was noticing that there are certain mastodon and mammoth teeth, these great elephants, that these teeth are not like any elephants that are alive today. And he said, he proposed that this is from an extinct species of elephant that's no longer here. Well, Thomas Jefferson, one of the great American presidents, who was also a naturalist, he said, no, this can't possibly be so. Nature would never have produced anything only to lose it, such as the economy of nature. So he didn't believe that extinction was even possible. So the Lewis and Clark expedition 
was launched in part, not entirely, but the Lewis and Clark Exhibition was launched in part because Thomas Jefferson wanted to prove George Cuvier wrong. He wanted to say, he, he took Meriwether Lewis aside and he said, Meriwether, when you guys go out there, I want you to find, keep your eyes on, I want you to find some mammoths because I believe they're still out there. Now obviously we know that they weren't. But this, so when we come to know something as factual, and, and I need to say this, because sometimes people say, especially conservatives or, or those people who don't believe in evolution, they say, well, wait a second, what do you mean evolution is a fact? Evolution is just a theory. And what I say is, well, gravity is just a theory too. Right? I mean, there's the theory of gravity, but then there's also the fact of gravity, right? I mean, if I step off a 12-story building, there's the fact of gravity, whew, down I go, and there's the theory. Why did he do that? <laughs> you know, both in terms of my mental state and also like, how exactly does that happen? And we have a friend, Brian Swim, who's a physicist. He got his, he got his PhD, okay? He did his doctorate in, in cosmology, but he, his PhD dissertation was on gravity. Here's somebody who knows more about gravity than probably anybody else in the world, or certainly he's in the top of those that know about gravity. And he went on a, on a fishing trip with his father after he got his PhD. And he was dropping a rock into his hand. And he picked up the rock and he dropped it. And he realized, you know, nobody on the planet knows more about this than me. And I have no idea why that rock is falling into my hand. <laughs> you know? Because he could explain the, 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 uh, the, gra the, um, the mathematics of it. He could describe it scientifically, mathematically. But like, what causes when I do this, like, and let go, why does it do that? I mean, we know that mass has gravity, but like, there's nothing that pulls it down and there's nothing that we can measure. It's like gravity is still largely a mystery. So there's both the theory of gravity, which is how is it that the Earth keeps the moon in its gravitate, how does that happen? And then there's the fact of it. There's, so there's the theory of evolution, which is how is it that events become more complex over time? And there's a lot of difference in terms of understanding that. And then there's the fact of the sequence of irreversible transformations in measurable time. Now let me describe what it is that I have here. I have 270 of the major transformational moments in the history of the universe. Each of these beads signifies some major event in the story of the universe. Here's, the, here's my beginning bead right here, the great mystery beyond all human language and understanding. And then this is all of our different names for the God, Goddess, Allah, all of our different names for the ultimate reality. And then what scientists call the Big Bang or what we call the Great Radiance. And I go through the early universe, like here's where the galaxies formed, and then early Earth. And then I go through the whole the, the period here, and then here's the dinosaur period, okay? And then I've got the, 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 the extinction of the dinosaurs and the mammals. And then I have right here is the beginning of the human. And here I've got human evolution and the significant transformations. And I've got, you know, uh, the Buddha and Lao Tzu and Muhammad and Jesus, the, or actually Muhammad's not there, Jesus, the Apostle Paul, Muhammad. And I've got the significant scientific discoveries. But I also have the major major events in my life. I've got the significant, I've got about 20 of the major, this is my grandparents coming over from Ireland. Here's my birth. Um, here's my first marriage, my children. I've got three kids, I've got them represented. So I've got all the significant events in my life story as well. Well, one of the things that you realize when you have the whole story represented like this is that each of these is a grace moment. It's kind of like, this is my Catholic rosary, you know? I mean, it's like, even though I'm no longer a Roman Catholic, you can't get, you know I mean? You can't get the Catholic out of me. This is my cosmic rosary. It's my universe rosary. But each of these beads is, for me, a sacred transformation. It's a, it's a sacred, and how exactly this happens is the theory of evolution. That they follow this direction is the fact of evolution. Yeah. Like, I can, I don't really get it. Like, why sure. Why do people um, like, assume this stuff, but they really, like, no one will ever really know? Yeah. Why do you worry about it so much that no one will ever know? Sure. The, well, the, the idea isn't so much that we descended from monkeys, for example. But the idea is that, that monkeys 
uh, let, let's, say, let's say the chimpanzees, the bonobos, which are the pygmy chimpanzees, and the humans all descended from a common ancestor. And what we, can't, what we have seen, what we have discovered in the fossil record, we've discovered creatures that are kind of like, a little like human and a little like chimpanzee. Or a little like human and a little like ape. Where we've, where we've, we've seen these transitions in, in evolution. And we actually, we, can, we found the bones. We found the, the, the creatures that are like kind of transitionary. We've also seen, for example, elephants. In fact, I don't know, if, do I have it up here or not? I think so. No, nope. guess not. Right, and sometimes that happens. Here is uh, some of the ancestors of the modern whale. Okay, and, and so Pachycetus, over time, and this is, see, the, the thing about evolution, why it's such an elegant theory, that is why it's such a, an incredibly like, oh, of course way of understanding, is that we have, for example, with bacteria, we can see bacteria in a very short period of time changing, becoming new species, become, adapting. Because what happens is something challenging happens and you make adaptations and then your children make adaptations and you kind of go a different direction. And so we see that difference. So we can actually see in fruit flies, we can see in bacteria, we can see in creatures that have short lifespans, we can see over a period of a thousand generations, major changes happening. Okay? The problem is we humans, we live for you know, 30, 50, 80, 100 years. And chimpanzees live a long time too. So yes, you're right. We can't go back and see that, oh, we can't see a human being descending from a common ancestor. But everywhere we look in the life community now, and that we can examine like bacteria, and when we look at the fossil record deeper and deeper and deeper into time, we do see animals that at this level are certain complexity, and at this level they're simpler. And at this level, the simpler, which indicates that things evolve because more and more things built up, that as life goes on, things become more complex. Yeah? Um, I don't know if you really answered the question or not, and it's probably kind of weird, but since we are making up God's body, like, what would you compare, like, if you're doing an analogy, like, us killing each other and, like, you know, the evils and stuff that happen, what would you compare that, like, like what's happening in God's body? Like, Beautiful. Great question. So if we are like cells in the body of God, if we're like a part of the larger body of God, how, what, what is to compare? I actually asked that question one time in a workshop that I did. And there was a medical doctor, a guy who was a, an MD, um, and he was a surgeon. And he said, he, he raised his hand, he said, I'd like to share my perspective. And he said, here's his lay, descri lay person's description. He said, cancer is a normal cell that becomes cut off or disconnected from its genetic memory. Cancer begins to, when it becomes disconnected from its genetic memory, it no longer has the guidance of millions of years of evolution. So it starts thinking that it's separate from the body. And cancer will then begin to consume the body of which it's a part. And of course, if cancer consumes enough of the body, it'll kill the body, but it kills itself, right? Well, he said, what do, you call, what do, you, what do people call our society? Don't we call it a consumer society? What does to consume mean? It means to eat up. Why are we eating up the planet? Is it because we're bad, rotten, evil, crummy, sinful people? Or is it because like the cancer cell, we thought we were separate from the earth? We didn't know that we were connected and we had millions and billions of years of guidance. So as we come to embrace this great story, this evolutionary story from a God-centered perspective, we then align and connect with the whole and we can have the guidance of all these billions of years. And it's like the cancer cell being reconnected to its own deep wisdom and so it no longer has to consume the body of which it's a part. But that's a great question. So there's the theory of evolution, which is how is it that, that the universe has gone from simple to more complex to more complex to more complex to more complex, creatures and the societies, that there's this direction towards greater cooperation and complexity over time. How does that happen? So that's the theory of evolution, and there's legitimate differences about that. But then there's the fact of a sequence of irreversible transformations in measurable time, and that that's a fact. So there's both the theory and the fact. Um, so this is going to kind of be as background. I'm not going to go through the details of this now. All of this is up on our website with, you know, explanations and stuff like that. But I just wanted to have this as background because it wasn't just an aha 
experience. It wasn't just like one person revealed the truth. This has come from the whole human community. There's Islamic scientists, Christian scientists, atheist scientists, Buddhist scientists, Native American scientists. This is the whole community of life that God is revealing this truth to. Because remember, when the Bible was written, people believed the world was flat, stationary, domed heavens. And, I mean, if God, if God is truly God, if God is truly generous and loving, like infinite love and generosity, then God would not have stopped communicating truth vital to human destiny and well-being 2,000 years ago when people believed the world was flat and stationary. So God clearly is, has still been communicating, but God doesn't... Pri See, here's the interesting thing. God doesn't primarily commute in, communicate in words. We think of God as communicating primarily in words. But God has been communicating throughout all of evolutionary history, long before humans, through feelings, circumstances, and relationships. That's how God communicates. That's how the whole communicates. Feelings, circumstances, and relationships. So here are seven revelations about the nature of reality. First is that evolution understood as a sacred story, that is in a God-glorifying, Christ-edifying, scripture-honoring ways. Evolution understood as a sacred story, not just as a meaningless chance thing, is a grand unifying and empowering worldview. What I mean by that is that many conservatives, you may have friends, or maybe one of you, just completely doesn't believe in evolution. Most people that don't believe in evolution don't believe in evolution because, and don't accept evolution, because they've never been exposed to a sacred, God-glorifying, Christ-edifying way of thinking about it. I mean, when I, when I was totally anti-evolutionary and was threatened by it, when I believed that evolution was the devil, the reason is because the only form of evolution I was exposed to was this purposeless process. I couldn't find God in it. So what I'm saying is that evolution understood in a sacred way is a grand unifying, that is, it unifies science and religion so we don't see the conflict between science and religion, and it's an empowering worldview. That is, it empowers us to co-create this, this, this world, this just, healthy, beautiful, and sustainably life-giving world. And it, it does so from the place of possibility. So we're not overwhelmed with problems like, oh man, look at these issues. But it's like we're inspired and empowered. Let's say we over here are living in a part of the world where we've never experienced sheep. Sheep just aren't there, okay? We can be certain that the Lamb of God would not be a part of our sacred story. Nope. And let's say over here, we're living over here, and we've never experienced the political reality of a king. There's no such thing as kings. Well, the kingdom of God would not be a part of our sacred story. In other words, our language, our religious language for ultimate things, for ultimate reality, always reflects the different regions in which we emerge. So every religion makes sense given the different bioregions, the different life regions they emerge. And just that fact allows us to be present to people of different religions and know that our religion is true, to know that our faith is grounded in reality, but to also know that theirs is too, but they come from a different experience. So we can begin to learn from each other rather than fight and kill each other over like, oh, well, no, mine's the truth. No, yours is the truth. We kill each other over our different respective understandings of reality. Because all human language is symbolic. What that means is that no language about God, no language about the universe, no language about ultimacy is literally true. All of it is metaphorically true. That is, it says something true, but it does so symbolically. All human words are symbols that point to a reality beyond what they can describe. Said another way, reality as it is will always be more than whatever we can say or think about it. And the analogies that I've sometimes used is, is that words are maps. They're not the territory. Words are menus. They're not the meal. But because language is symbolic, it's meaningful. That is, we can't not make, we can't not make events and processes mean something. If something significant happens in your life, say something really painful or something really joyous happens in your life, you're going to make it mean something. You're going to interpret it in some way. And you know, a year later, you may think about it and interpret it differently. And 10 years later, you may think differently. At the end of your life, you may have a diff very different sense of what that meant. So meaning changes over time. But even if I say something's meaningless, like there's some people that say science 
gives us a meaningless universe. Well, they're making it mean nothing. We can't not make events mean something. So even if I say something's meaningless, I'm making it mean nothing. Okay? But because right. language is symbolic and meaningful, it's consequential. That is, it does make a difference what we say about reality. And here's the example. Let's pretend, here's, here's where beliefs matter. Let's pretend, okay, I'm doing this because I'm pretending I have a set of lenses, a set of glasses. Let's pretend I'm looking through the belief system that the universe is out to get me. Okay? So I believe that reality is out to get me. And you do, what is your name? Lori. Lori? Lori does something nice to me. Is, is it Lauren? Yeah. Okay, so Lauren does something nice to me. Now, if I believe that you, the universe is out to get me and Lauren does something nice to me, how am I going to experience it? Yeah, right. Now, this fearful, distrustful. Now, even if she's out of the generosity of her heart trying to do something good to me, I'm not going to experience it because I think the universe is out to get me. In fact, it really becomes, it, what do we call that in our culture? If somebody thinks that the world's out to get them. Paranoia, paranoia right. So if I'm a paranoid person, even if somebody does something nice to me, I'm going to like see it. Yeah, right. I know what you're really thinking. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It really, I mean, I find evidence of it everywhere. Okay? If I believe that the universe is meaningless, there's no purpose, there's no process, there's no God, it's just it's all this meaningless, mechanistic thing. And that's the lenses through which I view? Guess what? I'm going to find evidence of it everywhere. It's just all going to be meaningless. However, if I have what I call the mystic perspective, or the inspired perspective, or the spiritual perspective, which is reality is conspiring on its own behalf. That is, God knows what God's doing. And the universe, as expanding in the heart of God, is a part of that whole thing. So the universe is conspiring on my behalf. Let's just say I'm pretending. Let, let's just say those are the lenses. That's the, the belief system that I have, is that even bad things that happen to me are a gift and a blessing in disguise. And I've got that perspective. And you do something nasty to me. Well, I'm going to have a, whatever feelings I'm going to have. I'm going to get my feelings hurt or whatever. But let's just, let's just pretend, if I really believe that the universe is conspiring on my behalf, what, what is your name? Claire. Claire. And Claire does something that, you know, whatever. I'm... I'm going to have whatever feelings I'm going to have, but pretty quickly I'm going to say, okay, what did Claire really mean? Maybe, you know, how is this a gift and a blessing in disguise? How is God using whatever she said or did for me to grow and to learn? And the only difference is how we're looking at reality. Whether we believe it's conspiring against us, conspiring for us, or it doesn't matter either way. So our beliefs matter. Our language about reality, what we say about reality matters. And it's another reason why Here's where, here's where what we say makes a difference. It's one of the reasons why gossip is so powerful. Let's say I've got a friend, uh, Samantha, that you've never met, and I say, my friend Samantha is so, she's one of the most generous, loving people you will ever meet. She's, she's pretty amazing. I mean, you just really. So I've created a filter so that when you meet Samantha, Maybe in the two hours that you interact with her, she only does one small, generous thing. But you're going to notice it because you're expecting to see that. Whereas if I say, oh my God, my friend Samantha, hold on to your wallet or your purse. I mean, she, I don't trust this girl. I mean, she, you know, I mean, you know, be careful. So now you're filtering for how she's stingy or how she's, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, or a thief or whatever. And so you're going to be full. So maybe in the two hours you interact with her, she only does one slightly selfish thing. But boy, you're going to notice that, right? So what we say about other people affects the listening, affects the eyes for other people. So it's one of the reasons why um, gossip can be so damaging. Because I can cause you to experience my friend Samantha in an entirely different way just by what I say about her. So number three, the universe, well let me say this, there's no such thing as the universe. That is, the universe isn't a thing. We're so used to thinking of the universe as a place or a thing, but the universe isn't a thing and it's not a place. The universe is a process, a divine process of greater complexity and cooperation at larger scale. So what I say is the universe is a, is a story of nested creativity, atoms, molecules, cells, organisms, and so forth, and cooperation at ever larger scale. Because the universe has gone from simple atoms to more complex atoms, to more complex atoms, to molecules, to more complex molecules, to more complex molecules, to creatures, to more complex creatures, until finally the universe achieves such a degree of complexity that the universe can begin to see itself and hear itself and know itself. And in the human, we are the human, we are the universe beginning to become aware of itself. That's who humans are. We're the self-reflexive consciousness of creation. 
We're creation beginning to come under, to, to know itself. So there's this process of cooperation at ever larger scale. In fact, there's a, there's a chart that I have that I, I won't go into the details too much, but I do want to at least expose you to it, which is there's a direction to evolution, which is partly, partly what this is about, is that evolution's going somewhere. There's a direction towards greater cooperation and greater complexity at larger and wider scale. So it's, it's cooperation at this level that makes this level possible. It's cooperation at this level that makes this level possible. And every level, there's larger and wider cooperation and more interdependence. You know what the difference between competition and interdependence is? Competition is when we're in a game together and one of us wins and one of us loses. Okay? That's just it. But true interdependence says, you know, we're in it together. Or maybe we're all in it together. We either win together or we lose together. That's interdependence. And what evolution, it, there's a direction. God's creativity is in the direction of greater cooperation and complexity, greater interdependence. And in the human realm, we see widening circles of compassion. It's very, very interesting. Do you know, no, I mean, you all may feel it. I feel it sometimes. We human beings have compassion for other creatures. And I'm not even just talking about just our pets, but, you know, other species. We've seen picket people demonstrating to protect the whales or the dolphins or other creatures. We have compassion that now expends beyond the human into other creatures. As we mature as a species and as individuals, that is, as we grow up and become more mature, naturally our circles of care, compassion, concern, and commitment naturally widen. So this is a direction to evolution. I may come back to this, but I want to, come, I want to go back to my chart here. So number four, God is an intimate proper name for ultimate reality. That is that, that infinitely uh, generous, infinitely loving, uh, largest nesting doll. The only difference, of course, is that this nesting doll has limits. It, it's, it's end, it ends here, right? So I'm talking about it, the last nesting doll, the largest one would be infinite. So it all holds all the other nesting dolls within it, though. So God is a proper name, an intimate proper name for reality, for ultimacy, and for the entire process. And here's a way of thinking about it. God may be infinitely more than a personification of evolution. God may be infinitely more than a personalization of the entire process. But God can't possibly be less than that. Think about that. Jewish and Christian theology has always said that God is imminent. That is, there's no place God stops and something else starts. Everything reveals God. But God is also transcendent. God is more than anything we can know, think, or imagine. But if God is truly imminent and omnipresent, then, then God can't be less than a personification of the entire evolutionary process. That God is at least that. Number five, time is leading to greater diversity, greater complexity, and greater intimacy with itself. This is what I mean, is that, that again, as the image that I offered was that God planted a seed, smaller than a mustard seed, in God's own heart, and it's been expanding within the heart of God, and that's creation. Creation as a whole has been expanding within the heart of God ongoingly. As creation, as time goes on, creation becomes more complex and more intimate with itself. That is, the universe, creation, what the Greeks called, you know, did, did I mention what the Greeks call ultimate reality? Obviously, they referred to God, but, but the, the largest, like the whole universe, they didn't call it the universe or even the cosmos. They referred to the whole as cosmos, capital K, proper name, this I-thou relationship, like a living being. They saw cosmos as a living being that we were a part of. They didn't see it as a thing or an it. It was cosmos. And so you could say creation. Creation is alive. Creation is creative. God made creation that was itself creative. So over time, creation is becoming more diverse, more differentiated, more complex, and more intimate with itself. In fact, let me, this will probably be the most important sentence that I say this whole time we're together. We didn't come into this world. We grew out of it. We weren't put here on earth. We grew out of it. We grew out. We're not separate creatures on earth in a universe. We're a mode of being of earth. We grow out of the dynamics of the universe. So how did God create humans? God planted the seed within God's own heart and it's been expanding and becoming more complex. And 14 billion years later, 
human beings emerged out of the community of life. And that's how God created. And for God, that may have just been a day or six days or whatever. I mean, for God, it's in the same way that a flea's life seems really small to us, you know, or a fly or a, you know, some of these creatures that only live for a few days from our perspective, it's like, for them, it's their whole life. <laughs> but from our perspective, it's just like, well, in the same way for God, 14 billion years is no big deal. You know, it's like, okay. But for us, it's like a long time. So time reveals greater complexity, greater diversity, and greater intimacy with itself. Humanity, human beings are an expression of this process. We're, we're not, in fact, the great Native American, Black Elk, uh, there, there's a great Native American uh, leader uh, that, that has since died. But he said, here's a great quote from him. He says, the first piece, P-E-A-C-E, -E, the first piece, and the most important piece, is that which comes within the souls of men and women when they realize their relationship, their oneness with the universe and all its powers. This is it. We're, we're, we are an expression of the universe. And to give God glory is to honor the whole, to honor God, to honor that creativity that's been expanding for 14 billion years and to give, give credit to God in that process. So humanity is maturing and our sense of self is expanding. That is our our concept of ourself. And here's, a, here's something I just want to offer as a, as a way of thinking. This again comes from mainstream science, but this is a way of validating spiritual principles. In spirituality, sometimes you hear people talk about our interconnectedness or our, our interbeing or kind of our oneness, right? Well, all that's kind of like, you know, those are concepts, but what do we mean by that? Do you know that you're, okay, I'm standing here talking to you right now. I'm made up of atoms and molecules. But these atoms and molecules aren't the same atoms and molecules that were part of me, say, six months ago. Every five days, I have a new stomach lining in terms of the actual carbon atoms, the oxygen atoms. The, I mean, the actual atoms of my stomach lining are renewed every five days. Once a month, I have a new set of skin cells. Every, every, every six weeks, I have a new liver. 98% of your body, I'm talking about the actual matter, the actual atomic, you know, the actual chemical elements of your body, 98% of your body is renewed every year. The 2004 model is not the same as the 2003 model. Now, I know you look in the mirror and you know that, but it's true, okay? So here's the thing. Where were the atoms and molecules that you call you that are sitting right here in your desk right now, sitting in your chair, where were those atoms and molecules six months ago? Anybody? Well, they were a part of all the stuff you've eaten, all you've breathed. Because when we breathe, when you breathe in, you breathe one with 20 zeros, that many atoms. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. You can be certain that you just inhaled at least three atoms that were once a part of the body of Jesus Christ, literally. And ask any, go to any college and ask the physics professors and they'll tell you that's true. But of course, not just Jesus Christ. You know, all the great men and great women and lousy men and lousy women of all time. Because when you breathe, you breathe out that many atoms and they go and they become a part of other people. And they become a part of other fish and snails and whales and other creatures. And when you eat, those atoms, those molecules become you. See, we've been thinking of our bodies like a mechanism, like a clock, like a thing. So you put gas in the car, right? Kind of like a car, right? You put gas in the car, it powers the car, and then there's the exhaust, right? No. Our bodies aren't like that because the gas doesn't become the car. The food we eat becomes us. So here's the thing. Because we've been in the room for almost an hour together, you now have atoms and molecules that are a part of your body that you call you right now that were me when we walked into this room. Pretty scary thought, huh? It's true. You share, we actually share ourselves with each other just by being in the same room. And that's a spiritual principle, that our sense of self. So it doesn't make any sense for me to identify myself as only stopping with my skin. And when Jesus said, the, the main commandment, I mean, what did Jesus say was the, the fundamental commandment, like the most important, if you boil the whole law down, what's the essence, Jesus? That's what they asked him. What's like the whole law in a nutshell? And you know what he said? He said, Love God, that is the whole of reality, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that is with everything you got, love it all, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. That is, extend your sense of self beyond your skin to include your neighbor and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the key to the kingdom. That is the key to the kingdom, is loving God with everything you got and extending your sense of self to include your neighbor. And this is a natural process. Humanity is going through this. I may come back and say more of this. And finally, death. Death is natural and generative. The word generative means creative. Death is natural and generative. And this is something that we didn't know for most of human history. We thought death was a problem. We thought death was, in fact, if you interpret Genesis literally, not only did we think death is a problem, we human beings brought death into the whole community of life. We're responsible for the existence of death in the world. That was the belief. Well, we now know that first of all, death long preceded humans. Dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. That's long before human beings were around. And long before that, other creatures died. So death long precedes us, but we now know that death is actually creative. So I'd like to share just a few things about death that can, that can give us a different spiritual perspective. We now have an understanding through, for example, geography and mathematics that if it weren't for the death of elders, you couldn't have children because we live in a spherical earth. Magellan in, in 1505 actually circled the whole world. He took a boat and went all the way around the world and it was the first time that we had proof that the world is circular. This is only 500 years ago, folks, okay? But in a circular, in a world that's a sphere, that it's not just infinite, okay? In a world of sphere, and Malthus in 1798 talked about how population, if population continues, that what we've got pretty soon, if you don't have death, you've got wall-to-wall -wall people, or even before that, wall-to-wall -wall bacteria. So in order to have, in a spherical, in a, in a limited earth, if you're gonna keep having birth, you've gotta have death. So what we say is that without, if you want a world of children, if you want a, a world that has room for children, death is an absolutely essential part of the, process. In geology, Hutton, Lyell, Louis Agassiz uh, in, in the 1960s, we now know that through erosion and through these plate tectonics and those, Earth is going through major, Earth is like a body. It's like there's a body of Earth. And, and Earth, the plants and the animals, there, there, there's respiration and the plants take in the oxygen, or they take in the carbon dioxide and give out oxygen, and animals take in the oxygen and give out carbon dioxide, and the bacteria, I mean, everything's functioning like a body, like a system. And we now know that mountains aren't eternal. Did you know that? Mountains aren't eternal. The Rocky Mountains, check this out, okay? Picture the whole, in fact, I think I've even got a, a picture of the, of the North American continent. Here's a picture of the North American continent 65 million years ago. There wasn't a North American continent 65 million years ago. You had Western North America that was hooked over to Asia. This was all land, Asia America. There was Eastern North America that was hooked over to Europe, Euro America. But this was a shallow seaway, the Bear Paw Seaway, that went right through the middle. This is, all, oh, this is water all through here. So this wasn't connected to this. And Mexico was all underwater. Well, 65 million years ago, an asteroid the size of Mount Everest hit here. And it hit with such force that basically it created a magnitude 12 earthquake, which is like a million times more than a magnitude 6 earthquake. It, the crust, it hit with such force that the crust of Earth began rippling and rippling and rippling and rippling and rippling and the crust on the very opposite side of the world from, from where this hit in India on the opposite side of the world that the ripples hit each other and this huge lava outpouring. Okay? It was, now there were no Rocky Mountains. There were the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachians had been around for about 150 million years and then the Colorado Rockies 62 million years ago began to rise. And when the Colorado Rockies began to rise, it started drying up the Bear Paw Seaway, and that was the birth of the North American continent. So the Colorado Rockies rose, and then because of what they were made of, they, they eroded down to nothing, or almost nothing, and then they rose again. So literally, the Colorado Rockies went through a death and a resurrection, and it was that process that actually made for healthy lands. 
It's the erosion that makes healthy soil. In fact, here's another thing. 17 times in the last 2 million years, the ice sheets came down, we call them glaciers, and then they went back. 17 times the ice sheets came down, came down to, you know, about, well, about here, and then they went back. And when the glaciers come down and back, they renew the soil and they also make new lakes. The reason that there's lakes in Ohio and, and, and Michigan and all, and there's not many lakes down in the southern states, is because glaciers, lakes ultimately over time will fill up. It's glaciers that make new lakes. So we now know that it's the death of mountains that creates healthy soil. So death at the geological level. Paleontology. We now know that extinction is a natural fate of species. That's, that extinction is common and in fact it makes room for new species. If it weren't for this event, if it weren't for the dinosaurs dying out, and, and you know how the, the, I've heard this described, how powerful this was? If you took all of humanity's nuclear weapons and you launched every nuclear weapon human beings ever made and they all went off at the same time in the same place, this event, this asteroid 65 million years ago was a thousand times more powerful than all of our nuclear weapons combined. Yeah? Is it a fact that that happened? Yeah. How do we know that? Because we can actually see the crater. There's a hundred mile wide crater that we can measure and we can not only measure the size, but there's a, there's a certain element that's only found in, in meteorites and asteroids and that we find it all around there and we find it all over the world at, and it's dated to 65 million years ago. Yeah. But that was only discovered about 15 years ago. What, so when your parents went to school, they didn't know this. What, what, what I learned when I went to school was that it was climate change that probably killed the dinosaurs. Well, there was climate change and there were dinosaurs that died out as a result of that. But this was kind of the final blow because what it did is it forced so much debris into the atmosphere that it choked off the sun and all the dinosaurs died and many other mammals died as well. But we can date it to 65 million years ago. But my point is that if it weren't for the death of the dinosaurs, mammals, complex mammals couldn't have evolved because mammals were these little creatures no bigger than about like this that were just terrified by these big ugly carnivorous dinosaurs. So now with all the dinosaurs gone there was no predators so the mammals could thrive and the mammals got bigger and differentiated and we had all different kinds of mammals. The, the, my point, again, why I'm talking about all this is that death is natural and generative. So there's other things as well here. Astronomy, we now know if it weren't for the death of stars atoms couldn't exist. Uh, we wouldn't exist. So I'm not going to go through all the details of this right now, but, but suffice it to say that earlier cultures couldn't have known this. It's not like they were wrong or they were stupid. They just, life hadn't complexified to the degree that it could understand this. So we're a part of this process. So let me just stop and open it up for any questions. Yes? Most of them did. Most of the other mammals, anything, anything in the whole world. Let's see, first of all, because, um, because the asteroid hit here, it actually hit like, uh, any of you familiar with golf? Like a chip shot in golf. It hit at an angle. So because the asteroid hit like this, it spewed tons of lava and all kinds of debris all over North America. So North America was torched. I mean, very few things survived in North America. But even the whole world was impacted because what happened is it caused all this fire and all this storm, so it choked off the sun and, and um, the only mammals that survived were probably those that survived around hot springs because they were like, the, they came out at night. We think that this is the beginning of frozen dinners. They came out and feasted on frozen dino dinners. <laughs> but, but most mammals did, in fact anything larger than about like this around the world died. Yeah, it's a good question. Other questions? Yes? Um, if you said um, the natural fate of species is extinction, what? do you think the like, human species will become extinct and like, other things will still be alive? Yeah, great question. So if, if, if one of the natural fates of species is extinction, in fact, what some scientists say is that 99% of all the species that have existed in the history of Earth are no longer here. So that would indicate that at least there's a very real possibility that human beings may go extinct, right? Well, possibly, but again, who are we? 
we are nature becoming aware of itself. And now our computer technology is like, our, our, our technology is really the evolution, excuse me, the evolution of humans. For example, the telescope is like the extension of our eye. The microscope is the extension of our eye. Radar is the extension of our hearing. I mean, so our technology, and computers are extensions of our brains. I mean, we're seeing, and you will see in your lifetime, I mean, we got some interesting stuff coming down the pike. I mean, we will see in the next 30 to 50 years computers becoming more intelligent than humans, and we will see human beings becoming more mechanized than they are now. For example, within the next 30 years, they'll have little nanobots, these little miniature robots running all up and down through our bloodstream and our veins and stuff like that, and monitoring our health, and they'll send signals to the inter through the internet to our doctor. And you may get a phone call, and I'm not kidding, when you're 40 years old, I'm 45, when you're my age, you might get a phone call from your doctor saying, you know, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, Sarah, I understand that uh, you, uh, your blood pressure's up. And how your doctor knows that is because you got these little robots running through you and they're reporting your, your health. This is not science fiction, folks. This is going to happen. Okay? So we will see a blending of biology and non-biological intelligence. And is it possible that there will be some kind of a hybrid human mechanism sort of thing down the road so the human species won't be the same as we were, say, a million years ago? Sure. But I don't, with the exception of the possibility of like an asteroid impact or something like that, I don't think it's likely that human beings will go extinct in the, at least in the near future. But is it possible in the next million years or five million years that human beings might go extinct in some way and something else might evolve that's more complex? I think that's possible. I mean, a couple scary scenarios of what that could be like. One is the Matrix trilogy. And the other is Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator series. Now, I personally think that it's not going to be like that. I think, I think our technology is going to help us live in a harmonious relationship with the natural world, that computers and humans aren't battling each other, but that computers will help us to evolve. And again, for me, the key is how do we do this in a God-glorifying way? How do we do this in a way that honors the whole? See, God-glorifying doesn't have to be some kind of mystical, airy-fairy stuff. It can be like, how do we honor the whole? So that when I... When I relate to you, I don't relate to you as a, as a thing to be used by me for the economic purposes or anything else, but I relate to you as a divine being, as a, as a cell in the body of God. So we treat each other with respect. So we treat each other with, with, with dignity. So we treat each other with compassion. And we treat nature the same way. We treat other creatures the same way, with that kind of respect, that kind of reverence. But we honor the larger holes of our reality. Thomas Berry, one of our mentors, says this. He says, um, I love this quote. He says, the, the, the world we live in is an honorable world. Okay, again, think nesting dolls. Earth is a creative system that we're a part of. It's one of the reasons why some scientists call Earth Gaia. Okay? That was the Greek name for the Earth Mother. So here he says, he says, the world we live in is an honorable world. To refuse this deepest instinct of our being, to deny honor where honor is due, is to place ourselves in a dead-on collision course with the ultimate forces of the universe. This question of honor must be dealt with before any other question. Ultimately, it's not a political issue or an economic issue or an even an environmental issue. Ultimately, it's a question of honor. Only the sense of the violated honor of Earth and the need to restore that honor will awaken in the human the kind of juice that we need to co-create this just, healthy, sustainable future. So I think the question of respect and reverence and honor is, is a key one. Other questions? We've got about 10 minutes left. Yeah. No, five. Oh, five minutes, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, this is going to sound stupid, but would you be okay stupid? if I ran and got the camera so I could take pictures for you? Absolutely. That one didn't sound stupid at all. She wants to take a picture of it for the yearbook. Other questions? Let me let me tell you. Okay, let, let me. Tell, yeah. So we have different realities. God is different in our realities. How can we build those different realities of God? Yeah, great question. I mean, if. if if because of our different cultures and our different language for ultimacy, we have different understandings of God, for example, how do we, 
how do we not, you know, how do we relate so that our differences actually can draw us, draw us closer? Here's one of the fascinating things. Remember before I talked about the mechanistic worldview, that is where we think the universe is like a complex clock, and how different that is from this nested creativity understanding? Okay? So if we have this understanding from a mechanistic perspective, our differences are a problem to be solved. That's all, there's no doubt about it. But from this organic nested creativity perspective, our differences are a solution to our problems. It's like the more the better. So actually different, the fact that you and I may not agree, or the fact that we may differ, or you, know, you may have different understanding, that actually can be a healthy thing if, if we can genuinely hear each other and let it into our heart. Because that's the key. If I can, you and I can be different, but if I just listen to you and I really get you, like if I just like get your heart, if I get your, like what you're trying to communicate, I'm going to be transformed in the really hearing and the letting it in. And this is why I say some of the most exciting stuff happening on the planet is where people of different religions and different philosophies are hearing each other, and in some cases for the very first time. Yeah, there's, there's one thing I want to offer you as an exercise, and, and it, it, it has to do with, in fact, if you don't remember anything else, I invite you to remember this. To take a piece of paper, it's like, okay, if the universe is going in a direction, okay, if the universe is going in a direction, and the direction of evolution is towards greater cooperation and complexity at larger scale, like if that's what God is up to, how can each one of you, how can each one of us find and fulfill our role in this great work? And so this exercise that I want to leave you before you leave class is how to do that, which is you take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle. And on the left-hand side, list all of the activities, the projects, the things that you love to do, that light you up, that give you joy, that give you a sense of energy and fulfillment, happiness. Maybe it's things you've never done, but it doesn't matter. If the thought is there that you'd love to do that in your life, you just list all that. You list all of it. It doesn't have to be practical. And then on the right-hand side, list all of the things you're aware of in your community or your school or your community and in the world, like the things you're aware of in your world where you feel the world's needs. Like not just where you intellectually know about what the world's needs are, but where do you feel it? Like where do you get pissed off? Where do you hurt? Where do you get angry? Where do you get frustrated or depressed? And especially where do you feel compassion? Where does your heart break over something that's happening in your world or your community? And you list all that stuff. And when you have your two lists, the stuff that's your great joy and the stuff that are the world's great needs as you feel them, you find the intersections. Where are the intersections between what lights you up, what gives you joy, what gives you energy, and what the world's needs are or your community's needs as you feel them? And those intersections where your great joy and the world's great needs intersect, that's your calling, that's your mission, that's your vocation. That's where you can be the cutting edge, the growing edge of what God is doing, what evolution is doing. And it's also the most soul-satisfying way to live a life. Because God helped the person that spends their life doing something just because it makes good money. If all we do is get an education so we can get a good job and make good money, we're not going to be soul-satisfied. But if we find, if where we find that places of intersection where our great joy and the world's great needs, and where we can be a blessing to the world, where you can be a blessing to the future, if each of you do that and you find where you can be a blessing, you will, you will be so happy and so soul satisfied that it will make all the difference in the world. So I'd like to close with a quote. And this is a quote from, uh, from Thomas Berry. And it, it, it gives you a sense of where I ground my trust or my faith and where God's activity is at. It goes like this. The basic mood of the future might well be one of confidence in the continuing revelation that takes place in and through the earth. The basic mood of the future might well be one of confidence in the continuing revelation that takes place in and through the earth. If the dynamics of the universe from the beginning shaped the course of the heavens, lighted the sun, and formed the earth, if this same dynamism brought forth the continents and the seas and the atmosphere, and awakened life in the primordial cell, and then brought into being the unnumbered variety of living beings. There is reason to believe, good reason to believe, that this same guiding process is exactly what's awakened in us our present understanding of ourselves and our relation to this stupendous process. Sensitized to such guidance from the very structure and functioning of the universe, 
we can have confidence in the future that awaits the human venture. Mm. Thank you.